Welcome, my name is Mikkel Thorpe. I'm the host of the Expat Money Show. And today I wanna to talk to you a little bit about my time here in Aruba. Now you might be thinking, why Mikkel are you filming inside your hotel room? Aruba is supposed to be a beautiful place. Why are you not out at the beach filming this? Very good question. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to visit Aruba before, but it is an extremely windy country. So after trying to film a number of times outdoors and trying to find the perfect spot and the wind blowing and things getting knocked over and papers going flying and the sun changing and music and people partying, I decided just to do this inside our room and I will try to have some videos in here showing the amazing scenery of this country. So I am here in Aruba with my wife. It is our wedding anniversary. We actually just came here for holidays. So I left our kids with my mother back in Panama and we decided to take a week off just to come and enjoy and relax. It's the start of the year and this is a great opportunity for me to reflect on my business and the year that we just passed and what I want to accomplish in 2020. 22 in the in the year going forwards. So let's dive into Aruba. I have a lot to share today, so let's do it. Aruba is a small island off the coast of Venezuela. It is a part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and we have 120,000, roughly 120,000 inhabitants here. Now, on top of that, we get roughly 2 million tourists a year visiting the country. That is split between flights coming in and the big cruise ships, and it's counted by either the cruise ships themselves or nightly visitors coming into the country. Now, there's actually over a hundred flights a week coming in from all over the world. We have direct flights from Europe, Canada, the US. We actually have flights coming in from 14 major cities in the US direct into Aruba. And you might be wondering, how does this compare? Are we talking about old numbers? Are we talking about brand new numbers? Let's put it in context for the pandemic for the last year. So comparing 2019 before the pandemic to 2021, last year, what we saw was June had 80% of the travelers, July had 90% of the travelers, and August had 88% of the travelers, going from two years ago to 2021, so num uh, year over year based numbers. So we actually saw that they're quite solid. And we're gonna get into some of the reasons why it was not affected as bad as a lot of other countries. Certainly they felt it here, but not to the degree that some of the other countries did. And as I said, we're gonna dig into that a little bit later on. Now keep in mind these numbers, anywhere from 88,000 to 120,000 came in from flights. The rest came in from the cruise ships. We've seen a big drop in the cruise ship, uh, people coming in, but the flights seem to be holding steady. One of my favorite things to do every time I visit a country is check out the real estate market there. So we actually went to visit the real estate office a couple of times, but every time we went, they were actually closed. Now in the window, it shows their hours of operation and they technically should have been open, but every time we went by, it was closed. So I don't know if they got called out to show a property and didn't have someone to man the office, or someone is slacking off at work and just decided to cut out early or take an extended lunch break. So unfortunately, I did not get a chance to speak with any of the local real estate agents, but they had a lot of the properties listed outside of their building, so I jotted down some numbers for you to kind of put things in context so you understand the cost of moving here or the cost of properties. So we found a three bedroom, 2.5 bath in a private community. This is a villa being done on the secondary market. The asking price was $420,000. Now this is all gonna be in US dollars. This is a US dollar economy. We also touch on what this means a little bit later, but in this real estate section, I will just be quoting in US dollars. So the gated community had everything that you would expect. They had a tennis court and a gym, they have pools. There was even a restaurant on site. So it really is its own community where you have everything you need on space. This place was fully furnished and it was completely set up for Airbnbs and these types of things as a vacation rental. Um, the next place that we looked at was a brand new two bedroom, two bath. It was a luxury oceanfront condo and the price came in at $682,000. Now, this is quite pricey. The place was only 140 meters square, but like I said, it was oceanfront, you were right on the beach, and the, the views looked spectacular via the picture. So it 
is a nice place to live, saying so it is not a cheap place to live. And the last place that I checked out was a five bedroom villa. It was a brand new home. It came in at 925,000. The lot size was 615 meters and the home size was 262 meters. And this is also set up to be an Airbnb. It actually has over $50,000 worth of furniture that is included in the property. And like I said, it is only five minutes from the beach. So a gorgeous place via the pictures, but once again, I did not have a chance to go out there and view the place in myself, unfortunately. Hopefully, if I make it back to Aruba, then we'll schedule these things in advance. I fully expected to be able to walk into a real estate agent, find an agent, and get a tour of these places, but as I said, they were not around. So the property taxes are a little bit complicated. I'm not going to read them all off. Maybe I can put them in the show notes below or you can find out more at our website. But basically, if the property is less than 67,500, then you pay zero property taxes. On the top end, if the property is valued at over $421,500, then the property taxes are 0.6%. Now, this is based on residents. If you were a tax resident here, if you were a non-resident, then the taxes come in at 0.6% no matter what the value of the property is. So you really have to keep this in mind if you're picking up a rental property and you don't actually plan on living here. While I was here, I did get a chance to sit down with one of the local lawyers. We spent an hour, two hours at the office. We discussed incorporation, the business formations, taxes, immigration, a whole bunch of dis different things. So he was very generous with his time and actually laid out a very clear picture of how things work in Aruba, as well as kind of some insights into who the people are and how they view things in this country. So one of the main things that stood out for me was if you're planning on moving to Aruba and you want to find a job, you're gonna find it extremely difficult. Unless you have some contract in place from something like the Marriott or the Hilton or one of these big hotel chains, then really the chances of you getting a work permit here or be coming over and, and creating a business or employing yourself are pretty much slim to none. Now, if you plan on coming here and you're either independently wealthy or you have some type of an online business and you can support yourself and you can show that you can support yourself, well then the process is very straightforward and doesn't take too much time. Now certainly you're going to need local representation. This is not something that you're going to want to go through yourself. There is a lot of different things that need to be qualified here. Of course you're going to need the normal things that we look at in immigration like a clean criminal record check. You're going to have to show money enough money to support yourself. You have to either show that you own a home here or you rent a home, there's different things like this that you're gonna to have to qualify for. If you guys want a full list of everything, then you guys can send me an email and I'll do my best to get that out to you. I was also really curious if they had an investor program here that is similar to the one in Curacao. The one in Curacao actually allows you to get permanent residency and from there, eventually apply for citizenship in the Netherlands. So this is kind of a backdoor route into the EU via living in the Caribbean. Now that's not something that we normally see, but it is a very interesting path to European citizenship. I discussed these with the lawyer and he said, actually, we do not have this there, although there has been talk about how this would work. Also with Curacao, how you end up spending your five years through there, it can be done through Aruba. It doesn't have to be in Curacao itself. So anywhere within the kingdom, you can spend your time. Another thing that I discussed with the lawyer was the free trade zone. Now, he was explaining to me that there actually is a way to set up things so that there is only a 2% corporate tax. So what you could do is you could have your goods assembled or manufactured overseas, and you do all of your billing or merchant accounts and these types of things through the corporate entity in Aruba in the free trade zone. And this would allow you to have only a 2% corporate tax, which when we get into the next section on tax taxation, you will see how drastically different this is. Now, there are a lot of caveats to this, and of course, I am not giving you individual tax advice. I'm just letting you know some of the opportunities that are here in Aruba. It also seems that Aruba is really interested in FDI, foreign direct investment into the country. There are every major hotel and brand and American type of fast food restaurant and these types of things that you would expect to see in any holiday destination. They have it 
all here. Now, when I was speaking with the lawyer, he really explained that the motivation of the local people is not very high. So yes, they want a lot of FDI. However, they're not really motivated to go out there and make it happen or actually provide any of the things that they promise. So it's good that it's coming, but they don't really care when it is coming. I thought this was very, very interesting. It is such a competitive environment out there for investment that I would have thought that there would be a little bit more hustle to try to complete these things. This really goes to show you in the next piece, which is a bank account. Now, their uh, AML and their KYC, Know Your Customer um, Anti-Money Laundering laws here, are extremely strict. He was explaining to me that these are some of the most strict in the world, and actually opening just a local bank account, just for on the individual level, can take upwards of two months. They're gonna be looking at anything and everything, who you're associated with, where the money came from, every single penny. Now, I deal a lot with offshore banking, and I'm used to KYC and AML, but the way that he described it certainly was a lot more arduous than than any other country that we deal with. And I guess that it's really known for being such. And I'm gonna guess also that this has a lot of the tie due to the fact of the strong ties back to Europe and the Netherlands. The last thing that I discussed with him was on cryptocurrency. I wanted to understand what are the laws that are surrounding cryptocurrency? How do the governments view it? What do the banks think of it? All of these types of things. He really didn't have a lot of comment for me on this, basically saying that there are no laws, but they have taken notice of what's happening in El Salvador, and it really has made an impact. Are they going to do anything about that? We will not know until that time comes, but at the moment the door is open. They are, I wouldn't say friendly, but they're not negative towards things. So that is going to be something that we have to watch as it unfolds. Okay, taxation. Now, if you are a resident of Aruba and you spend more than 183 days in the country, you are now going to become a tax resident. It is a progressive tax rate with the highest coming in at 52%. Wow, that is pretty brutal. Now, they do have a number of other taxes and I'm gonna to try to list these very quickly for you. Now, for a dividends tax, they have a flat tax rate of 25%, except for the years 2018, 2019, and 2020, which was reduced to 10%. As of now for 2021, I have not heard of any reduction being done for this, but we will see as the tax year progresses. Some other good news is in 2018, they actually abolished the wealth tax and the inheritance tax. So there is no wealth, no inheritance tax in the country. Import duties in the country range anywhere from zero to 57%, with the majority of them coming in at 12%. But tobacco, for example, is at the high end of 57% for goods imported into the country. Resident corporations in Aruba are subject to a corporate income tax called a profit tax, and it's due on their worldwide profit. A resident corporation's profit tax is at 25%, and Aruba has about 35 tax exchange information treaties to prevent double taxation. So there are ways that we can mitigate these things. And lastly, distribution of dividends by resident corporations are subject to a 10% dividend withholding tax. And there are no withholding taxes on interest or on royalties here. Now, this is certainly not exhaustive of all the different taxes that you're gonna find here in Aruba, but I just cherry picked some of the ones to kind of make a case for and a case against using this as a, as a country, either as an expat or as an offshore jurisdiction, just to kind of paint a picture for you. Next, I wanna to talk to you about timeshare. Now, I actually went and visited a timeshare presentation with my wife, mostly because I just thought it would be funny and she's never seen one of these before. But it was certainly illustrative of the environment here. And this kind of reflects back to what we were saying on why the country did not see such a massive dip in the tourist industry here. And I really believe it is because that they do so many timeshares in this country that people really had to use up their points because it was a use it or lose it type of situation. So when we sat down with the salesman for the presentation on timeshares, he really wanted to make us feel very lucky to be with him. He must have told me a dozen times how lucky I was to be sitting with him, that he had brought out his Mont Blanc pen so that I could sign the contract today, and he was Santa Claus, and he was making, going to make my dreams come true. He said, after this conversation, you can call your kids and tell them that you found their child's godfather. It was 
unbelievable the arrogance of this salesperson. Now, I've been through a lot of sales presentations and a lot of marketing present presentations in my business career, but this one was over the top. My wife actually told me at the end of it that she wanted to vomit blood. I was digging my fingernails into my palm listening to him speak. And all I wanted to do was just kind of get through this presentation, see the contract and see if there was anything there just so I could have a better understanding. I must have asked him a half a dozen times about the contract and just wanting to see it. He also went on to brag to me about the pen that he had, this special Mont Blanc pen and how much he paid for it, how much he was thinking about paying for his next boat, or that he had been to 30 countries in his life. Like this was something that was really going to wow and impress me. He was talking about all the drinking he's done and these gambling competitions and all of these different things that just really mattered not at all to me. Name dropping baseball stars that he's worked with or that he met in a poker tournament. And I was like, these things things just do not matter to me whatsoever. I didn't pretend to be impressed by any of them. I explained to him what I wanted and what I was looking for, the information that I wanted to hear. I just wanted to see the properties. I wanted to see the contract, understand this quote unquote new point system that they're replacing the timeshare world with and understand how this affected the economy of Aruba, which was really what it all came down to. So the offer is this, you get free quote unquote travel for the next 40 years. And when you're too old to continue traveling, you can pass it on to your children for an additional 40 years of free travel. And this is all done through the point system. So you purchase a certain number of points, which allows you to get them back every single year. It's like topping up a renew the renewable points, like filling up a glass of water and you get to use them every year. Now he brags that they're for everywhere in the world. But actually when you start looking at the contract, really this company only works in I think four or five countries in the Caribbean with the majority of them being an exchange program with another point system with a admittedly larger program. But every time that you want to exchange points, they charge you a fee. So to acquire the points, you have to purchase them. At the moment, they're saying that they're worth 49 cents a piece, but actually you can cut a deal to get them at a cheaper price. I know that they're trying to sell things off right now and raise capital so that they can continue to develop. Now, I wanted to understand more of the business model and how this all fit into place. Now, they were saying that there was no hidden fees and that there was nothing in there, but actually when you start looking at the contract, there is quite a few other things. Every time you want to make a trade or an exchange, there was additional fees. There was a membership that had to be done. There's a book that needs to be play, uh, bought every year. There's all of these things. So for the example that he was giving us, it was going to come in at about 4,000 US dollars a year. So you make a one-time payment of say $100,000 and then every single year it is $4,000 after this. What it's basically doing is creating a high-end continuity program. I think that what they want is for people not to actually travel. They say that if you don't use the points, it's okay, they carry on to the next year. Now, when you start reading through the contract and the fine print, this has to be done at a certain time of the year. So if you're in on a silver package, then it has to be done, I believe it was six months in advance, and a gold package was less than that, maybe three months, and if it was a um, elite package, which was the one that he was showing us, the presidential package, presidential elite, something like this, it was 60 days out. And if you don't do that, then you're going to lose the points. The points could also be banked for a maximum of three years. So you can't just let them accrue every single year and then do an entire years of travel on top of that. So I guess the way it works is that instead of going to the bank to raise capital to produce new hotels or new resorts, they raise the capital from the investors themselves. Then they charge them an annual upkeep to maintain these places and to keep it active. Now, I have no problem with this, but really the way that it's presented is that you get to travel for free every single year. Um, that is certainly not the case. Uh, they are going to charge you for anything and everything in between. I think it does add a lot of stability to the economy. They know that they have this money coming in no matter what. Um, 
also the way that they position things that they're going to give you the world and they're going to show you the world. Or as, as, as the salesman said, I'm going to show your wife the world. I thought that was a little bit presumptuous and I really don't appreciate other men talking to my wife that way. But nonetheless, that was one individual. I don't think that there is anything inherently wrong with the program. I wouldn't call it a scam or anything like that. But it is a scheme and it is one that people need to understand. And you will see that this company is all over the island. They have a lot of properties here. They have a lot of people that are pushing this. I assume that there's very high commissions on it. The other big thing that you need to really watch out for is to secure your spots and all these bonuses that they're going to promise you. You need to put 10% down. Now, traditionally, people are putting that on their credit card, then going home and refinancing the rest, either taking out a second mortgage or if they have cash in the bank or moving around funds from their brokerage account to pay the remaining amount, the $100,000 or $200,000 whatever they agreed to put into this. Now, if you don't get this done, I think it was within 15 to 30 days, then their interest program kicks in at 13.7% annually. So that is right in line with a credit card. And I actually looked at if you default on this, if you change your mind, if you decide that this is not something that you want to pursue or continue with, they're going to expect that payment be made in full. And after 30 days, we'll up it to 18%. And in the contract states that they will actually send debt collectors to actually come to come after you to retrieve the remainder of the money. So be very, very careful with these schemes that what you're participating in is something that you are 100% in. Otherwise, they are going to take you to the cleaners. The last thing I'll say about the contract is that I asked a lot of questions during the 90 minute presentation, 90 minute, two hour presentation. And a lot of the things that he said were going to be in the contract, when I actually went through the contract with a fine tooth comb, were nowhere to be included in there. For example, he says that in the contract, there is no way that they can debase the value of the points. And actually, when you look through the contract, there is no language in there whatsoever. So my fear would be if you went through a program like this and you bought $100,000 worth of points and this allowed you to spend, I don't know, say a month's worth of travel in the resort on the shoulder period or on the off season, that in two years, three years, four years, and you go to use those same amount of points, that you'll only get three weeks or possibly two weeks of vacation. And I have absolutely zero trust in a company over the next 40 years that they are not going to debase their points enough to continue to make things profitable for themselves. If you look at any type of these point systems, whether that be frequent flyer miles or points from a grocery store or any type of collection point, they're always devaluing these types of things. Just look what's happening with the US dollar and the Federal Reserve on how they're debasing their currency so that they can continue to spend. And you want me to trust that this is going to be done over the next 40 years and then 40 years of my children's lives. So aggregate of 80 years, you're not going to change the value of these, pr of these points. I just don't believe that is the case whatsoever. And as I read through the contract, it is not included anywhere in there whatsoever. So this is just something that you, not, you have to watch out for when you're talking to the sales rep on what he says and what is actually written, because it's only what is written which is actually going to be enforceable. As for the properties themselves, they were okay. I mean, the beach was beautiful. It was fully groomed. It was beach combed. They had nice amenities. The apartments themselves were a little bit beat up, a little bit worn down. The good thing I can say is that they were very large. They showed us a two bedroom, three bedroom, and I think it was a four bedroom penthouse. Uh, they were huge properties, um, full kitchen, living room, uh, ensuite bathroom, et cetera, et cetera. So for a larger family, these are ideal. Now they were a bit beat up. We saw a lot of chips on the door frames. Uh, a lot of it could have just used a fresh coat of paint, these types of things. They were not new places, but they were okay. I don't have really anything bad to be said about it. But if this was their flagship program, then I'm not sure what I would be looking at for some of the other countries or some of the other properties that they have. Now for COVID, all we had to do to get into the country was show a negative PCR test. It couldn't be more than 72 hours if you're coming from Panama where we are, but I heard that the US and Canada has changed to no more than 48 hours. There is no vaccine mandate here, which is very nice. So if you are non-vaccinated and you are looking for a place to vacation, then Aruba is open to you. Now for masks, the official rule is that you have to have your masks on at the restaurant 
restaurants or entering into the restaurants, I assume, and in shops and in the malls and these types of things. In practical sense, the only time that we got told to put a mask on was if we were coming to the restaurant or the, the shop or something like that during the daytime. At nighttime, they were just far too busy. There was too many people around and the shops would not police this themselves. I honestly think that most people did not care. So it's kind of funny that during the day and the shop would be completely open, they would ask you to put your mask on. But during nighttime, when there might be 50 people in there, there was no one there to say anything to you. As for the streets, there was no one that had their masks on, um, in locals or foreigners, tourists, it didn't really matter. No one has their masks on outside, which is very nice to see. And all the bars, the restaurants, people are out drinking. It's really in full swing here. I mean, I would say that the mentality is that people really don't care about COVID whatsoever. They are going out, they're going crazy. All the tourists here are having a lot of fun. There was so many activities that we, we went through. No one ever asked us to put a mask on. We went out to see the flamencos on a private beach. We did, uh, we rented a Jeep and went four by fouring. So we had to go in and rent that. We went and visited caves while we were there. There was tour guides. No one asked us to put on a mask. No one seemed to care about social distancing or sanitizing your hands or all of these types of extra, extra things that you're seeing in many countries around the world. So that was kind of refreshing to see that they didn't really care so much. So to bring things full circle, I think Aruba is a beautiful country. It is excellent to vacation here. It is hot and humid all year round. We didn't see any rain. The topography and the geography of the country is very, very interesting. We actually rented the 4x4 and went into the national park. It's all cactuses and deserts. It is very, very beautiful here. The wind is really, really strong. I brought a Panama hat to protect me from the sun and it tried to blow away a few times. So I don't necessarily recommend that. There are tons of activities here, no matter what you're into. If you're into kite surfing or boating or yachting, snorkeling or scuba diving, if you just want to lay on the beach, if you want to go out there and explore nature, if you want to eat and dine and drink, they have it all here in Aruba. Aruba is a modern, diverse country. We saw people from literally every walks of life here from all over the world. The main languages we saw spoken on the street were English and Spanish. We did hear a lot of Dutch spoken by the tourists, but never by the locals, not even once. So that was very interesting for me. The food here has been excellent. They have high quality food. It is imported from around the world with a lot coming from Colombia, meats from Argentina. They have local fish and fish from some of the neighboring countries. They even had fish from Panama here that were uh, promoted on the menu, um, saying that it is not cheap by any means. My wife and I have been going out for dinner every night and they were ranging anywhere from $50 on the low end to $200 on the high end. This is for two people, maybe one, maybe two drinks, and just a main course. We didn't have desserts or anything like that. So certainly budget quite a bit of money for food, especially if you have expensive tastes. Once again, the country is a US dollar country. Officially, they have their own currency, but we did not see the, the local currency used whatsoever. All prices were quoted in US dollars, and it really didn't seem like they used the local currency all that much. They do have a central bank here, so it was kind of interesting to see the dy dynamic between the two currencies. Um, other than that, it is one of the safest countries in the Caribbean. They have a safety rate even higher than Barbados and certainly higher than a lot of the countries here. And I would put it on par with a lot of the Western European countries in regards to safety. So that is always very nice. So that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video on Aruba. We had a great time here. I'm not sure that it really ticks a lot of the boxes for an expat or what my clients or my subscribers are looking for, but it is a great place to come on vacation and I highly recommend it, especially if you're into activities and you don't wanna just sit on the beach. There is a ton here to do. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like and subscribe below. If you wanna find out more about my work, then you can go to expat money show.com. You can subscribe to the podcast there or join our private Facebook group at expatmoneyforum.com. That's it. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks so much. Bye.